Good. All right. I don't have a gravel, but we will start. Good afternoon. Recording in progress. All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the budget. Uh, part of the agenda tonight, we will first stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and National Anthem. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, sing, can you see by the dawn's early light what so Start with, uh, oh, sorry, roll call. Here. 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 So we will start with administrative salaries on page 183. Anyone? Mr. Chairman, we have presented a transfer from this account. Okay. I can read it if you want. Please. So the administration recommends that the following ESSER spending charge be changed as follows. So it's to reduce the position of Director of Climate, School Climate and Culture, and to add four Climate and Culture Specialists. So while it's ESSER spending, it would affect, ultimately affect the administration account. I believe this has been provided to the school committee. Thank you. Yep. Any questions? Member Mailman? Yeah. We don't have to stand nope. during finance, okay. <laughs> Weird rules. Um, so Brian, you're you're alerting us that that's through the chair that you that this change is Part of the changes that we had asked for that we hadn't seen yet is that what this is or is this a change that's through the chair since the finalization of the budget but during the briefings that we provided the school committee members we had indi indicated to the school committee that this change would be made at this time to reduce the director of school climate and culture and adding four climate and culture specialists for the middle school level Okay, and th then that was part of the book or not part of the book? This is a change to the book, is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so it appears, depending on which total you take, that, that our administrative salaries is about 4%. I don't know if you'll buy that or not. I use the uh, 460, I use the general fund dollars. How, can you help help us or help me understand how that lines up with other districts how you, you know where are we in terms of SOA increase for that line item can you speak to that please through the chair so 
the way DESC captures administrative spending, we've summarized in the informational section of the budget book, which essentially says we are one of the lowest spending uh, communities of our peer communities for administrative spending. You may recall that one of the school committee policies um, has adopted a um, cap on administrative spending, in, which is one and a half percent of, foundation, of the foundation budget, and the FY24 budget is still below that level of spending. Okay, and that is whose rule? Our rule? The one and a half percent? The, the school committee adopted that as policy, um, I'd say eight or nine years ago. Okay, and is that that has never been revisited through the chair? Through the chair, at this point, that hasn't been a need to revisit that level of spending. Yep, and, and but in relation to, if I can finish, in please. relation to foundation spending, uh, we are still far below what the foundation budget allocates for administration spending yep. in terms of our actual spending. Okay, um, when we see we see a lot of um, threes. When we see three, are those quadrant positions? Like if we're adding three, um, director of curriculum and uh, seeing if something pops out at me at the moment. It's my notes from the other day. Coordinator of um, McKinney Vento grants, including ESSER fund three positions in this line item which I actually think referred to the Director of Curriculum and Professional Learning. No, those are all separate positions. So through the chair, if I can, any of the numbers in parentheses indicate the number of those positions? Okay, maybe I was. Are some of the additional, like the, the climate specialists or things like that, are, are maybe not the climate specialists, they are school specific, but are some of the positions, you know, add-ons to the quadrant system? I don't know if we have a, um, I don't recall if we have an updated org chart with all the new positions, so many of which we had approved before. To the chair, there are no administrative positions that okay. are new for the quadrant model. Okay. The teacher salaries is next. Okay. All right. That's all I have. Thanks. Member O'Connor Novick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through the chair to administration, I. Um, I, I will say that I'm, I share what I think is Member Mailman's I, I, um, maybe befuddlement is too strong a word, but um, in terms of sort of what's moving in and out, do are we 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 are eliminating the coordinator of alternative education program and we're creating a director of alternative programs, or are we not creating a director of alternative programs through the chair to administration? We are changing the coordinator of alternative and making that a director of alternative um, with, and there's already a job description that exists for that. There is already a job description that we've approved? That's been in, on the books, not approved by this committee, but it exists. Okay, um, so that's, that's a, it's a position description that we haven't yet seen, just to make sure I'm not losing track of what we're doing. Correct. Okay. Because it, yes, absolutely. It doesn't, we won't be bringing it to committee. It's already um, something that was approved probably before any of us were in place. Okay. Um, and then the, the, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the dean positions um, because uh, I, I, I honor the intent and I understand um, what, what we're trying to do. Um, I appreciated the idea of a pilot last year um, that effectively kind of tried out the position and, um, in, you know, gave us a chance to see how it worked. Um, understand the bit of information that we got in the budget reflection. By the way, I would have it would have been helpful to have gotten the 
the tr proposed transfer as part of that as part of the agenda. Um, the, um, the, the, the struggle that I'm having is that last year was intended to be a pilot to allow us to reflect on whether or not this was an effective use of that position. Um, and I'm still feeling as if I don't really know that for sure. Um, and I understand that it was asked for by the secondary principals. Um, and I also feel like I've, I've done this enough to know that the principals pay attention to what is being granted this year. And that's one of the things that's being granted this year. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to make a motion about it right now. But I'm un I, I will say that I'm uncomfortable with are going from one to everywhere um, based on the limited amount of information that we have. And I, I at least um, am going to view those as being on a trial basis um, because I, I don't think we have yet proved the efficacy of that position. And I want to make sure that if we're doing something like adding whatever it is, an administrative support position or what have you, that we're doing it in the place that actually doing it in the place in a way that actually makes the difference that is intended. Um, so I think that's the only comment I have on administration. Anybody else? Uh, Member Johnson. Thank you <clears throat> to the chair to the administration. Just in, in regards to that, when when it comes to the dean of students and addition of those five positions. Can you just explain what the like what the job will entail? Because I, I know when it was first piloted last year, um, there was certain criterias. I believe you guys looked at that and felt that there was a different way to kind of do this. So I'm just trying to figure out what, for us to understand kind of where we're going with this and, and what that entails. Thank you. Madam Superintendent. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm going to have both um, Dr. Tatum and Mr. Foley speak to how we plan on, well, how we how the position worked this year. And just to remind the committee, we actually weren't able to start this position until about November, so not a full school year um, at North, and how we plan on growing it and what this would look like um, at all of our high schools. And so Dr. Tatum will speak to it, and Mr. Foley will speak to it. Um, and then if, if need be, we'll have Annie, and then I'll come in and, and finish for all of you, okay? Go ahead, Dr. Tatum. Dr. Tatum. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, much of the work of the dean position, the chair, has been on uh, culture and climate work, um, working on student safety, um, development of relationships with students, with families, between students and families. Um, there is a discipline component in collaboration with the assistant principals, and really trying to provide our assistant principals with more time to be the instructional leaders that they are um, and, and taking, uh, sharing that, that work with assistant principals around um, discipline in, in schools. Mr. Foley. Through the chair, but additionally, we also envision the dean of students supporting the transition of grade nine students from middle school to high school. We know that students who do not success, who are unsuccessful in that transition have a significantly lower rate of graduation. So we see this as a key component to increasing our graduation rates down the road. So our grade nine, uh, the um, dean of students will serve also as a support to incoming students in all kinds of different ways, both academic, social, um, will work with them restorative work, will work with the teachers of grade nine to make sure that they are um, attending to the needs that grade nine students specifically bring to school with them to ensure um, a successful transition in a successful grade nine year so that we don't have students who repeat grade nine and we don't have students who because they don't get off get high school off on the right foot don't have success thank you Thank you. And through the chair, just a follow-up question with that. So in, in essence, they, they will be assistant, assistant principal with all grade nine students coming into the building. And what that will also entail is some culture and climate stuff, working with the culture and climate um, coordinators in a school. Am I correct about that? 
Okay. And then also with that, would they be also working with um, ensuring that 504 plans are implemented, discipline, working on mediation, other things like that in regards to their role as a dean of students? Through the chair. That would actually be more of um, that, that last piece, the 504s, the, um, what was the other thing you said? The, um, I'm sorry, I forgot what you said, but I, I, 504s and there was something else that you said, discipline. Discipline. Not like infractions, but more like, um, so the dean is about the prevention work at the school, right, with the climate and culture teams and, um, and the school adjustment counselors and creating a school culture that is welcoming and has that belonging spirit to it, as well as any students that are high level needs, um, they would do the restorative work with those individuals. But more specialized 504s or any kind of, um, that would, those would fall under our, in our um, special ed world and, and through our quadrant teams they would help with the 504 work as well. So um, the dean won't be clear of that, right? But they won't be the, the person doing the oversight. We're going to have our, um, our quadrant teams with our assigned ETCs helping with that at the school level. Thank you. Um, and I just have one more question through the chair to the administration. Can someone, what is the student assignment director? What is that? Through the chair, that's the director at the Parent Information Center. Okay. And we're hiring two of those. Although it's budgeted for two positions. Right? Uh, Dr. Tatum? If I can just clarify through the chair. Um, Mr. Johnson talked about um, grade nine and working with grade nine students. I just want to make it clear that the Dean of Students is not solely for grade nine students. Right? right. They'll be involved in a lot of the work with the tracking um, but in terms of other elements of the, of the school, they'll work with all grade levels within, within the high school. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. All set. Okay. Member Kamara. Yeah. Thank you to the chair. So I just want to echo my colleague's um, comment with regards to this dean of students. Um, so, I, so I'm a bit confused of this as, as well. Um, and it's a bit confusing, number one, because I think when this was first brought to our, our attention with us piloting this, um, it was hopefully we we're using data to um, support the need of us having this at North High. Um, I, I'm just a little bit curious as to if we're using the same data to support that, this need. Um, I don't think you know these positions are, are should be here, to be honest. I do think with what I'm hearing, I'm hearing a bunch of different things, and I'm asking myself, like, where, you know, like the pool of people that are already in place, and we have, like, sometimes I, when, when the comments were given, I heard something that a school adjustment counselor may be able to do, and then I was hearing something that maybe a school, um, maybe psychologist is able to do, or maybe like a school, or maybe if we have more, external like support, like therapeutic support for students, which I think we need to also focus on. Like I know there was a grant opportunity last time and maybe I think only four companies or organizations apply to those. So I mean, those are the things that I really want for us to um, increase more of um, than, and then use data to ascertain whether or not we do need these director positions with these amount of salaries um, and whether or not that is going to equate to you know, physical, psychosocial outcomes, academic outcomes as well among our students. I'm a bit, uh, yeah, and especially have, we have not have gotten data of the first position already. Um, thank you. Thank you. If I may, Madam Superintendent. through the chair. So we spent time with our uh, superintendent student advisory in May, and we asked the youth specifically um, more information, we wanted to better understand what they needed as it came, when it came to wellness and supports. Because I think as adults, we seem to make assumptions that um, they all need therapists or they all need counselors or they, and, and there are children who need that. But overall, what they told us is they need 
time to socialize. They need community built back into their schools. It's missing. They need it, and they need it now more than they did in the past because things are come, they're still trying to heal from close to two years of isolation. And so they're looking for ways where they can have breaks in their school day, not long breaks, they're not looking to mess around. They're saying, we just need time for community, for pride building, for um, connection with each other, for socializing, these basic things that we as adults, when we were in school, we had. And um, over time, they don't, whether it's missing or it's not enough right now because of the results of, of the pandemic, this, this came from our students. And so as we sat and we listened to them and they told us this, we thought, all right, so we need people at the school and we can, we can use our existing staff, we're just, we're asking more of them to do this, to create these spaces for them, to create breaks, wellness days, um, working with our youth around student voice and find out from them because what works at South might look differently than North, Doherty, all of that. So I just wanna put out there and, and share the student voice because when we sat and we heard them, it really gave more clarity to us about what the needs are. And again, it, there was some who said, there are some students who need more um, higher level needs. But in general, our greatest need is for us to be able to connect back with each other. We're missing that. And, um, and so we wanna keep that in mind as well. Now we see these, these deans as helping to create that culture of belonging at the schools. We believe that there is nobody who that's their primary role. Everybody has that hat that they put on off and on, but the primary role um, at the school that has not been there. Um, so that's what we're looking at. And, and we heard it from our youth telling us that just as early as May, and then I heard it in my listening and learning tours over and over again. How do we shift and have climate and culture that's much more positive, that's much more um, inclusive of all the different people who come into our schools and, um, and the overall student well-being. So I, I think that that's important as, as we think about these budgetary considerations. Mm -hmm. All set? Okay. Um, Member Clancy? Thank you. Um, so through the chair, just on the, my only point on the deans of students, um, when working with the principals, um, do they, I know that if we say we're going to give you an extra body, any, any principal is going to say yes, please, you know, we'll take them. So they understood what the deans will be used for and they really felt the need for this in their schools? Absolutely. I actually want um, my quadrant, if, if one of you, because you've spoken. I would appreciate spoken, that. Yes, mm -hmm. I think that that would be helpful. Through the chair, absolutely. Okay. This is a position the principals are looking to have. And when you were at Barnco, would you have liked this position? Yes. Okay. Um, my <laughs> other question, just real fast, and just looking at the schools that, obviously, the high schools, and is it possibly something down the road, if it's working, we get the data that it's truly working. We know that North is working. Um, I, would we look at putting it in the other high schools, the smaller ones? Madam Superintendent. Through the chair. So right now what we're budgeting is to have it at um, the four comprehensive mm -hmm. and then Worcester Tech. So if, if the data showed, then absolutely. Okay. Um, and we might, you know, there might be a need. We can also start to think about um, over time how we might repurpose some other addition or positions as um, you know matriculation happens. I also want to put for the committee to consider um, that if if indeed the desire that there is still some trepidation, we could go a little bit slower. We could say um, we can use we can take a look again at data and say well we won't do everybody all at once. We'll do a few more and we can, but that would that's something to consider. Um, it does slow down, again, the movement of creating these, these learning spaces where students are, and adults are at a place where they are best ready to learn. So through the chair, just to be, I'm, if the principals want this, I have the experts in front of me saying they want this, 
I'm fine with it, but I would like to see data down the road. Um, and I'm fine with going, you know, putting them at all the other schools. Um, just to be clear on, you know, I just want to make sure that um, it's something that's needed, and I'm, very, I'm fine with it. Thank you. Uh, Member Novick. Thank you. Um, first of all, I think someone used e ETC, and that was also in our backup. I don't know what that is. Through the chair. Through the chair, it's a team chairperson. A team chairperson. Evaluation team chairperson. Evaluation team chair. Okay. So it's a special education position? Mr. Allen? Yes. All right. I think I'll probably, I, in which case it will be in the teacher account. I should ask questions there. Um, okay. Um, I, I feel as, I, so I want to echo what Member Clancy just said in terms of, um, you know, if an administrator is offered a support position, they're going to take it. I, um, I, I feel as if the more we talk about this, the less I have a good understanding of what it is that they're defined by doing. Um, and uh, having heard students talk about um, coming back from remote learning um, and having heard what they've said about their needs and the way the buildings are and so forth, I really don't feel like an administrative position is actually responding to that. Um, and I, I say that, you know, not, I think there are other things in here that do. Um, but I, I feel as if the, the dean position keeps being this sort of shifting, um, a shifting spot that the, 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 the position description that we approved um, and then also this sort of, if the person is, I mean, we have this, this sort of, this conversation in, in other contexts, right, which is that if you have somebody who is in charge of discipline, you don't want that to be the person who also then is in charge of, you know, creating a particular kind of climate. And yes, you know, the, we talk about teachers or parents or anyone who has to do both aspects, but um, I really don't, I, I, I have no wish to sort of pull things out of a school in terms of, of that kind of thing, but I really don't feel like this is a, a position that's being particularly well um, well defined in, in terms of this. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it, Mr. Chair. Member uh, McCullough not being heard, then we'll go Member Kamara, then Member Johnson. Thank you, and I'd just like to thank you for providing additional information. The feedback that I've gotten from schools well, from North was that they thought that it worked very well for them and it was a successful pilot for them and that that did result in other schools requesting them. And I've heard a lot of positive feedback from Burncoat about the excitement around the position and from some of our other high schools. So I am in support of the positions. I would just echo that I'd like us to see more data at the end of the school year about the efficacy and that we are clear with the schools about the, what the responsibility is and that it's not. And I think, um, I don't want to speak for Member Clancy, but I think I was kind of understanding what you're saying. You know, of course you're going to want an extra support staff or body in the school, but make sure that we're utilizing them for the reasons that administration has created the role. So thank you. Thank you. Member Kamara. To the chair. Um, yes, because, yes. So I guess like my thoughts um, remain the same, but I, I'm curious, is, is it that we are having these deans of students to, to merit this was like the dollar amount because that's the president's, that's kind of what we set with the other positions. Because um, I, I, one of the things I, I see on this, one of the pages over here is that we reduced a director of climate and culture to four specialists. So, um, which this is a bit confusing, but, um, So is there a need that something can be looked into? Uh, Madam Chair, Madam Superintendent. 
path with the chair. I'm sorry, Member Kamara, I'm not sure what your question is. So uh, the dollar amount um, for these positions and, 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 the, and for the Dean of Students positions, um, is that was, I'm trying to understand, is that the same salary that we have for the, that, the one that, that we yeah, approved? The contract that is um, per the, this is part, they are part of the EAW, and so this is their uh, contracted amount, their contracted salary. So they, they have the same salary as an assistant principal. So it's a unit B. Interesting. So that means it's not the same as what we approved the last time. It is. Oh, it is. Okay. It is. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I kind of maintain my position on this. I don't feel the need that uh, we need all of this. And if we did, I, I want data first because you usually have data first, information first, and then. And I want to also congratulate you know, and comment on all the principals who you know gave word that this is necessary. But I think the fact that we're blindly approving this sum of money or monies um, for this position without clear clarity, it's a bit um, vague for me. And um, yeah, and I think we should you know be utilizing this money to actually support students. And I don't think um, my comments are the same with my colleagues now there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Member Johnson. Yes, sorry. Um, just a follow up. Um, to the administration. So again, I'm with some of my colleagues, I, I actually did have a conversation with staff at North and, and kind of went up there and for them it was a great model um, in, in speaking with the dean of um, students and in, in the collaboration um, that person was able to have with the principals, with the school adjustment counselors, even the nurse and the teachers and kind of build that relationship and kind of work with the climate and culture individuals in the school definitely made an impact. Um, so I'm definitely in support of that. In regards to implementing it into the other schools, can you just kind of talk about the training that they will be going to um, in regards to doing this work? Um, Madam Superintendent? Yes, through the chair. So the, the plan is, so recall that um, we were able to fill the Administrative Director of Positive Youth Development, Mr. Tony, um, in January. So he started in January of this school year. He took on the role and the only dean at that point was, was Al. So moving forward, the deans will be trained under Mr. Tony on restorative justice, on the, um, the uh, due process of of behavior, right? So when a student, when there's an infraction, I've noted that we need more training on how do we do due process so that children actually get a fair kind of hearing, if you will. Um, they will be trained there. Mr. That won't be just the deans, it'll be our assistant principals as well, but they'll be trained under Mr. Tony on restorative practice, on due process, and on um, positive behavior interventions. And that will be a regular training, and then the expectation would be that the deans would then provide oversight to the climate and culture specialists at the school, no, assistance, I apologize, climate and culture assistance at the school based on the data of the school. So if they're seeing issues happening in certain parts of the school, then the climate and culture assistants need to be there more regularly than other places um, as they're creating that, that connection between children and staff. Um, and the dean will also provide oversight of those climate and culture assistance, and if they need additional training, that will come through Mr. Tony. So in the past, we did not have that, or this school year, that model was just getting started. We did not have a good um, training system. Moving forward for next school year, we will. Um, Ms. Asalosa, is there anything else to add in terms of training? Because I know it's restorative work. I know it's um, the uh, due process. I know it's positive interventions. Anything Ms. else I'm missing? Mrs. Esolosa. Through the chair, it's also we have just implemented the uh, culture and climate teams in the schools, and so the dean of students would be leading that work. There's a team of individuals that com are comprised at the culture and climate teams, and so they're identifying capacity challenges, conditions that are integral um, to um, those challenges in order to have outcomes, and so they're going to be leading the culture and climate teams in the high schools. And Mr. Tony will be 
training them and supporting them and the leadership of those teams? He has already begun. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Well said. If, if I could, okay. Ms. Kamara, Member Kamara, if I can um, refer you to an, any other committee member that's interested in the data outcomes, if you look at um, uh, GB315.1, GB Annex H, that's got the data, um, the suspension data for North High School, so you can see a comparison. Thank you. I think I it's agenda page 35. Okay. No, I think. Okay, we all set that. So I just thought that position was done in November was a great idea and, uh, for the dean, and I uh, look to see that how it proceeds in other schools over the next year, and uh, looking forward to it. I think it's a great idea, and uh, it's going to make a difference in kids' lives. So. Much appreciated. Um, so we're going to pass. So the motion is to approve the. Uh, I, I can wait. Did we do the transfer, Brian, or, uh, Mr. Allen, already on the uh, on the on the uh, administrative salaries for climate and cultural specialists, the 447. We need a roll call on that. Or this? We, we'll take a roll call, but it's actually out of ESSA funding. But to recognize okay. that's the change in funding, I think a vote of the school committee would acknowledge okay. that transfer. Okay, so to approve that transfer, roll call. Member Clancy? Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. 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 Okay, so approval of the administration salaries. All those in favor, opposed, so ordered. Yeah, I'm going to actually take myself she out of this one. Say it again. I'm going to um, recuse myself out of this one. Okay. I'm going to recuse myself. Are there, yeah. You need to recuse yourself? Huh? No, she wants oh, a roll call. A roll call. Oh, roll call. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, roll call. Member Clancy? Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Roll call. Yes. No, no, but no. Th she's doing the roll call. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No, you abstain? <laughs> Yes. Member, Markdown member Kamara is abstaining. Member mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member Yes. Yes. Okay. Now we are on teacher salaries on page 186. That member Mailman, followed by Member Novick. Thank you. Um, Mr. Allen, in a, in a, through the chair, uh, Mr. Allen, can you, we are, sh we have 200 open positions right now, and we had X number of open positions last year. I'm, re I'm looking at the, at the backup that was given to us. We had a budget of 203,000 and we spent 203,000 for our, our expected expenditures are 202,000, so right in there. If, if we had that many openings, why don't we have a bigger line item and a general, a bigger difference in our expenditures? Mr. Thank you. You, you follow sorry. my question, I didn't finish it. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. If you, if we had to, we had adopted a budget of two hundred and three thousand, we expect to spend two hundred and two thousand on general fund teacher salaries. Yet we have, which includes secondary teachers, student services, special ed, blah blah blah. Um, we, but yet we had two hundred open positions through the year. How? Why did we not spend less money? Or do we continually m mess with the budget number? Can you, that's Mr. a bad. <laughs> Mr. Allen? Through the chair, so the easiest way to answer the impact on this year is all the new positions from last year's budget was to rest of spending. So it wasn't necessarily reflected in this account. So as we're making adjustments in our spending, um, as we've um, discussed over the course of the year, this is where some of those savings have materialized from, is in position vacancies. So okay. we, we're pre-funding SOA bridge funding 
one year in advance new spending in the budget. And so if there's vacancies even within those new positions, we are realizing those savings within the ESSER account. So that's why we had 17 million last year in ESSER and we're only recommending 11, I'm sorry, 11 million this year. Is that so basically the delta? Through the chair, the $17 million from last year included the hold harmless money, which has been transferred back into the general fund. So we've been using a number of $13 million as our SOA bridge funding. So when we looked at last year's, um, adopt, when we voted to adopt the budget last year, were we looking at $203,000? $203 million, I'm sorry. Mr. Allen? Through the chair, the adopted budget was $203 million, correct? And then what would the, so are you saying the ESSER spending at that time would have been? In addition to that. And because we are, so how are all of these unfilled positions recognized through this budget? Mr. L? Through the, through the chair, so our budget also re anticipates vacancies which get included in the calculation. We have a vacancy factor built into our budget calculations knowing that none of the positions are going to be full, filled for the entire year. Okay. To, the, to the tune of 200 positions? So the overall budget this year has a vacancy factor and all the salary accounts totaling about $6 million. That's the answer. Okay. Thank you. All set. <coughs> okay, Ms. <coughs> Ms. Novick. Member Novick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we are adding um, adjustment counselors with the intent of bringing ourselves to the ratio of the, the 350 to 1. Um, looking back at the staffing formula in the back of the book, um, for guidance counselors, the only note we make is that the American School Counselor Association recommends caseloads for guidance counselors of 250 to 1. I don't, I don't see a place where we talk about that, um, and I don't want to sort of underestimate the importance of guidance counselors as we're doing this, these changes too. Would anyone offhand know both what our ratio is and is there any, are there any changes being made in terms of our, our guidance counselors for this year through the Chair to Administration? Is this simple? I don't know if any of us have that number right now. It was under Dr. Sipple. <laughs> we have a new Dr. Indi Sipple? But I, but I don't know if you have that. Yes. Through the chair to um, Member Okanonovic, we looked specifically at our school adjustment counselors. We have not started down the pathway on our guidance counselors yet. Um, doesn't mean we're not going to be looking at it in the future, but maybe do, if you have those numbers, or Mr. Chris. Dr. Sippel. Uh, through the chair. So I don't have those numbers uh, handy. However, um, my recollection is that when um, there were additional positions added two years ago, three years ago, that effectively reduced, uh, uh, achieved that 250 to 1 ratio for guidance counselors at the secondary level. Um, I, I would say that, um, and I, my assumption is that probably some of this is going to be the conversation of the college and career department as we move forward. Um, but I would say that, at least in my experience as a parent, that, that if that is, if that is where we are, then that is probably still too high for us. Um, that I don't think that students are actually getting the support that they need, regardless of the direction that they're going in, um, to have the really sort of, um, a thoughtful um, conversations that really are necessary for students to get what they need. So I, I guess I would flag that for the administration's attention. So moving to the um, what was just mentioned, the ETC, which I guess are the evaluation team chairs, um, as they were represented within. I just I, I know we say this all the time in education, but if we can make sure that our acronyms are spelled out as much as possible. Um, 
the so um, are they within this account the ten? I, like I didn't actually have a chance to add that, that I don't think that's actually necessarily possible. Is that the 10 additional school-based teaching positions within line D or where are those ads represented through the chair to administration? So, for the chair. I so, the, the, we, so when we asked um, last, at the last meeting, there were places where there were um, unassigned new positions. My assumption is that that was what we were getting. Is that is is it that we were actually getting that there were we were getting all all assignments we that we weren't just getting the new assignments? Is that right? Through the chair. So this year we've traditionally we've had unassigned elementary classroom teachers, which the school committee I think has been fully aware of that we assign in August mm -hmm. based upon actual class size. We've actually adopted that for both secondary and special education this year as well because okay. there's a lot of moving parts. So there are still unassigned positions as of today to be assigned during the summer months and deployed at schools based upon enrollment, course selection at secondary levels and special education needs. Okay, thank you. Um, and then to go back up to the, the earlier line, um, we thank you for the information regarding open positions, and I understand that this is a moving target this time of year. Um, so we have, of the 30 positions budgeted for, for psychologists, um, six of them are open. Um, and for the 92 positions of school adjustment counselors, um, only 86 of them are filled. And so I, I guess I would be interested in hearing from administration um, about what our strategy is here in terms of filling what we know to be um, positions that I think probably every district and probably the country is looking to add um, so that we're not sort of in some cases here we're adding positions so that we're not just effectively adding open positions through the chair and madam superintendent if I could have dr. Koo come up and she can speak to the work that's getting started, well, that's been going on. Where's um, Ms. Perez? I don't, oh, there you are. Uh, Ms. Koo. Perez has been starting, but I'll, I'll let Dr. Ku and if Ms. Perez wants to add anything. Dr. Ku. So through the chair, we are recognizing that these are positions that we really um, need to be thoughtful and cognizant. We've been working very closely with each of those departments, and we actually have already started. We hired much earlier this year than we've mm -hmm. ever hired. So what you're seeing in there, and I think I, I framed those numbers by saying that it is a moving target, and we took that we want to make sure we had accurate data in the moment, and so that was what was the open positions as opposed to what was budgeted and what we pay for that time period. And that's why I put that qualification on there to say we know that as people are resigning towards the end of the year, we're hiring new people, it doesn't reflect all of those numbers. But to your point, we because we hired earlier this year and we were very, very strategic in our hiring, we are able to, we are filling those positions much, much quicker. And I think that um, the, the contract also helped, to be honest with you, and so all of those factors have really supported us in what we believe will be a year that we will have much fewer open positions. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Um, we are adding um, six preschool teachers. That's fantastic. Um, and obviously, there are sort of changes also happening in terms of um, some some assignments. It could through the chair administration. Where is it that we'll have preschool next year? We have Miss Kelly coming up to speak to that. Miss Kelly. Oh, hi, through the chair. I do have a list of all the preschools that I can send to you. I can pull it up on my computer and get it to you. Um, we're keeping all of the same. We've added a full day preschool in all quadrants. So every quadrant has a full day preschool. We've added two or three sale preschool classrooms. We've um, shifted some preschools, the Chandler Magnet preschools are going, one's going to Clark Street School and one's going to Helm Park. 
And we, of the six, we have added three brand new classrooms and we have three in the pocket once we know our needs. But we do have available spots. I believe it's 98 spots are still available with what we have. So we have three because a lot of times in the fall we get new students and students with special ed needs that we have to address. Great, okay, and thank you, because you've actually led into a, to a second question for me. So the sale classrooms are clearly us responding to what we're seeing as sort of growing need um, among our student population. I also know that one thing that we heard over and over again when we were doing the SOA hearings was um, the, the ongoing put need from families for us to simply have more pre full day pre-K, that half day pre-K really only does people so much good. Um, is there, is that sort of part of the scope of what administration sees as us moving towards? Madam Superintendent. Through the chair, that will be our desired state. Okay. Of course, we have to look at facilities mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, the committee will be happy to know that we met, we've started our meetings with the, the city. We had another meeting today. We're really trying to look at a full master plan um, but we, we firmly believe and know that full day preschool is what our children need. Um, and so finding ways to do that over time, absolutely. Um, and I mean, partly it's just the competitive school committee member in me, but I, my heart breaks a little bit every time I see another headline of like another district moves to full day, full, you know, complement pre-K, which I think it was Springfield this year again. Um, so I'm glad to hear that. The, the final thing, Mr. Chair, is this. Um, in the backup that we got regarding um, changes that, um, revisions that were made since we got the budget book, um, the, the GB3-150, um, the very first item in terms of changes, um, item number two was that um, administration plans to hire four rather than six integrated coaches to start the Q team work. That would then open up to um, teaching slots that we're funding through ESSER. Um, I, I plan to make several motions to try to move towards something which we can talk about when we get to paraprofessionals. Um, but I'd like, Mr. Chair, this is um, aligned to what we did with the other one where it's ESSER funding that's being moved rather than actually moving money out of this actual account. But I would like us to take what I believe would be $185,000 from that line within ESSER and move it to um, paraprofessionals. My intent, just to be clear to my colleagues, um, is that um, something we haven't talked about for a long time, although then we talked about it a lot, was the fact that um, we still have kindergartens in Worcester that don't have a paraprofessional aid. Um, my understanding is that there's about 20 classrooms that don't have and an, a second adult in those classrooms. Um, and what I'd like us to do is to pull together the funding over the course of a couple of accounts here um, for us to be able to fully provide 20 paraprofessionals to that account, specifically to the kindergarten, to make sure that we're starting next year with a paraprofessional in every kindergarten classroom in the district. So Mr. Chair, that would be $185,000, but again, it's ESSER. Um, I don't know if Mr. Allen would prefer that we do a sort of re vote of recognition. It's not really a transfer. Okay. Okay. What does that mean? Like, as far as the hundred eighty-five thousand, what's being used for now? The ESSER. So the two uh, integrated coaching positions that we had indicated during our budget briefings with the school community that we weren't going to fill right away would be converted to kindergarten I, um, para educators. So this just goes on. When did you say that? When did you give us that information? Um, end of May. <laughs> okay. So this is just in line to what you told us. Okay. And the budget, I guess, was printed. Through the chair, we actually um, have another, or to meet the same need which is to increase the number of instructional aids so that we have one in every, we need to find 20 instructional, uh, my apologies, paraprofessionals. Um, we actually have another um, 
option that we'd like to, that I'd like uh, Dr. Morris to speak to before the committee makes a, a final decision on that. Uh, Dr. Morris. Thank you, through the chair. So is early childhood is a important initiative for our district moving forward. One idea that we would like for all of you to consider is currently we have 30 literacy tutors that work 15 hours a week. And it would be our suggestion to consider moving these positions toward the early childhood positions as KIA so that we could ultimately uh, realize that optimal ideal where there is a, a, a second adult in every kindergarten. Instead of this? Uh, yes. Okay, so, and where is it? So 15 literary positions? The, I'm sorry. Did I get I'm that? sorry, they're called you, literacy tutors. Literacy, I'm sorry. And over the time, uh, we've reduced the amount of hours that they work. So they currently work three hours a day. And we think that we may potentially be able to meet the need of our earliest learners by having two adults in every kindergarten, as Member Novak had, had um, brought up to the committee. Madam Superintendent? We currently have 30 of those literacy tutors. I want to make sure I'm using the right term. Um, budgeted for. So we're, that's an, an option where we can repurpose those funds. That's already budgeted in the budget book. Repurpose those funds um, and, and meet the need. Okay. Do we have to move money tonight or is it also, is this? Uh, we would need to move money tonight. What's that? I'm so okay. We go. So instead of doing what the proposal I was, wasn't done yet. we're going to take 15 literacy positions. We're going to move that to the paraprofessionals is for the secondary person in the classroom or? I said, I thought you said 15. I wrote 15. Uh, Oh, 15 hours, so 30 positions. Okay. So we're going to move that to the paraprofessionals budget? Okay. That's what the administration's recommendation is. Okay. We have Ms. McCullough's next. I wasn't done. No, oh, you asked questions still? Yeah. Sorry. No. So I, the, the, the position, Excuse so me. that doesn't sorry. really answer my question, Mr. Chair, because um, we were told that the only four positions were going to be filled, which then means that there's there is money that was already intended to be allocated within an ESSER that is then not being allocated. Can I ask then what's what's happening, please, through the Chair to Administration? Mr. Allen? Through the Chair, so just as a reference, I'm going to get to your, the literacy tutors are on page 214 of the budget book. It's $623,000. You would actually have to use both the literacy tutors and you're 185000 plus another $100,000 to fully fund 20 KIA right. positions. We need, so, okay. So it's line D on page 214. Right. Um, I, yeah, we'll have more to say as we go along. Um, so we, I mean, the answer to your question, I think, Mr. Chair, is that there's no transfer that needs to be made yet. We would be doing it when we did educational support salaries and paraprofessionals. It's not actually within this account. Um, I think if I'm understanding Mr. Allen correctly, we actually would need to make the 185, we would need to move the, we would need to at least acknowledge that we were using the $185,000 in addition to whatever we do from here on out. We need that regardless of what the plan is. Okay, Member McCullough. I'm all set. McCall. Through the chair to the administration, would, I forget, I don't have to say that during this, right? Um, <laughs> did administration have other intentions for the use of that $185,000 in ESSER with those positions not being currently filled, or that's not an issue for us to utilize that that way? So, through the chair, so it, it would have been part of the overall ESSER strategy that we've been talking about with regards to one-time payments and so forth, but we believe that this would be a more favorable reallocation than perhaps some other positions listed in the budget. Thank you. Um, Member Kamara. Thank you. I just want a, um, a clarity here. So 
Um, are we saying that um, the the funds for the paraprofessionals that were maybe transition the, the, those funds to allocate it towards the 30 literacy tutors, so therefore we won't have the amount um, of additional paraprofessionals, but we just have the 30 and then maybe some paraprofessionals? I'm, I'm confused. Through the chair, I'm sorry. Um, I'll try to be more clear. Our goal would be to um, increase the amount of kindergarten IAs. And in order to, to do that, the transfer amount would not be enough. And we are considering that we could repurpose the line item for the literacy tutors to that aim so that we're able to ensure that we're able to have another adult in all those 20 kindergartens right now that do not have instructional assistance. Can I, through the chair, can I just frame, perhaps maybe this will help. In order to add 20 kindergarten instructional assistants, we need $900,000 to cover that cost. So this would be $185,000 towards that $900,000. The administration, when we get to the account, is recommending literacy tutors of $623 go towards that $900,000. Thank you. OK. OK, I get it now. Member Glancy? Actually, I'll wait till we get to the um, educational support salaries. Thank you. OK. Anybody else? Oh, so, so we're going to move. So the 30 literacy tutors will cover the 185000 Is that correct? No. No, <laughs> no never mind. Yeah. The 185,000 is are the two additional integrated coaches that we are not filling. Okay. That's the 185. Okay, or that's so we're going to move that. Recommended not to fill, correct? So and you recommend that back in May that we wanted to do this, so we will take that. Do we never? So yeah. So, I, so again, I think money. similar like we did in, in the administration account, a yep. motion to reallocate ESSER funding from the integrated coaches to um, kindergarten instructional assistants, I think would be in order. Okay. So we'll do a roll call on that. Roll call. Yes. 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 Okay. Any other questions on teacher salaries? So we get a motion to approve. All those in favor, opposed, so ordered. School committee, motion to member mailman. You want to raise? Um, sit down. A, a question, I th and I think I um, we're going to have a brand. We're going to have many brand new members, one way or another, this year. And I thought personally that. Um, our training, our MASC program that we went to was very valuable. And I, did, I guess this is, appears somewhere else in our budget, uh, Mr. Allen. But, but do, we have, um, do we have training for all of us to go? I don't recall. Last year, some of us went, and maybe that was because of schedule. Do you actually budget everybody to be able to go to that? Um, training conference through the chair so that's out of our staff development account so okay. we fund and the school committee members to attend that training through the and that's covered yes so we okay so whoever would be able to go we'd be able to do that all right and then the second issue is the salaries and um i understand that this is our budget we don't have control over this item but i also understand that this is city council purview and that it's not just um, a charter item. It, it, charters could be dealt with in a home rule petition. I absolutely believe this to be an equity issue at 50% of the funding as opposed to city council. And I guess at this juncture, all I can do is appeal, appeal to the mayor to um, bring this to council. Um, I assume that you might think that this is an outdated percentage that's been used for a variety of different reasons, and I'd ask you to to bring that to your body, to your other body, to um, discuss with them, and 
see if we can do something like a home rule petition. It isn't going to impact any of us here because it's going to take forever and a day. But it's but it is what we should be going forward. If we're looking at equity, we should also be looking at equity for these bodies that we um, are in charge of. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else on Skookum East Towers? Member Kamara. Thank you. Um, just going back to the question from member, member Novick, I mean, not member Novick, um, Millman, um, for the for the the training that we may be a part of and the funds that have been generated for that, is that, does that cover like hotel and all that? Like what is within the cost? Does it cover hotel fees to go there, food and transportation? Member Allen? Member uh, to Allen. the chair, in the past it has covered the registration fees and accommodations. So that, no one cool gas going down for fourth, yeah, travel, yeah. Everything's covered. Normal costs. Okay, so we have a motion to approve. All those in favor, opposed, so ordered. What's that? Oh, do you have another question? I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. And um, I would like to thank you so much. Um, I would like to ask you for the, um, what is this one? The account 500. 91112 for school committee salaries. I would like to inquire from you, what do you think, um, or how do you think we can make such better? Because I'm interested in your views with equity um, reg with regards to that line. Um, so if you can share an insight in terms of your views to that. Mr. Al? Oh, can I put this to the mayor or no? What number are you at? I don't see it here, I'm sorry. Line 500, you said? Or? No, the school committee salaries. Still the same line. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought you said five, budget number 500, I'm sorry. So, what's your question? So, yeah, my, my question is um, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, this is like my first um, term. And um, I'm a bit, I'm, I'm interested to understand, like, when because I heard equity in, with regards to this school committee salaries here and I want to understand your views towards that with regards to the item that um, member Millman just spoke about. That's, member Mill can speak to it. By asking me why, I don't understand the question. So basically this is governed by the charter. So if we want to put a petition in front of the school, s s s the city council, there's a few ways to do it. The city council can pass it, we can put it on the ballot, we can do a home rule petition. And, and uh, so that's how way you do if you want to change it. Oh, that's oh, that's so those, that's the process. Yes, yeah, that's the process. Okay. The school committee can't do it; It has to be the city council. Yeah. And so your view is that we we are in line to 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 doing that? No, not right now. No, there's no. There's no this will take like member Mail wants to say this will take about a year, I would think, or maybe several months. Oh. Yeah. So uh, uh, is that a way for us to start, or? Yeah, you can put the petition in front of the council and you send it to MO. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Member Clancy. Thank you. Um, I just want to go, just to be clear, if that was something I, I'm not in support of it. I'm happy with the job that we're doing. Mm -hmm. I'm happy that we do get the stipend from the city. Um, I know that a lot of school committees do it for free. They do it voluntarily. And mm -hmm. I'm, like I said, I just want to go on record and say, I'm happy with it and I'm approving this budget item the way it is. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. So we can we approve the school committee now? Are you still, um, do you recuse yourself? Or? Yeah, for the other stuff. Oh, Excuse me. Okay, yes, no. I'm oh, sorry. it's the one? I'm sorry. Yeah, Remember I just tomorrow? wanted to follow up with that. I, so I, I, don't, I don't think the question of was more of, of understanding question. I don't think there is, um, it was the, 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 the notion of, you know, what I just heard. Um, I think, you know, one can, accept and approve and favor and do all that sort. But I think sometimes there needs to be questions asked yeah, sure. and answers um, given. So especially when there's lack of clarity. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. OK. Are we good now? Those in favor, opposed to what? OK. We are on, it's getting late, so. 
instructional, oh, there we go, instructional assistance. Hi. Anybody on instructional assistance? Teacher oh, did I miss one? Salaries? Okay, we are on, oh, teacher substitute salaries. Okay, on page 191. So I, I know there was some, I thought we're changing the policy a little bit when it comes to substitute teachers. I think I read somewhere, maybe it was in your letter, like trying to be competitive more in salaries and, uh, and how are we doing? How, how is that working out for the next year? So you think it must be hard to get substitute teachers, I would think, right? Through the chair, we actually, the committee took um, action right when I started yeah. in July and we increased it. That helped. It's not ideal. It's been a difficult time to um, staff. Um, I, I don't think we're making any, I, we're not making any recommendations to increase it at this time. We're competitive in that area. Okay. We do want to continue to fund it um, because we should have both our building substitutes as well as day-to-day -day subs available. Okay. And we have used them throughout the year. So it's working out. Okay, good. So motion to approve. All those in favor, opposed, so ordered. We have instructional assistance salaries on page 192. Member Novick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through the Chair to Administration, um, in the answer to our budget questions, um, we were told that there are approximately, because we know this is a moving target, 87 open paraprofessional positions. Now, my assumption because we, as we learned elsewhere in the budget, you know, the enormous preponderance of our paraprofessional positions are special education positions. My assumption is that, that most of them are probably within that special education area, but through the chair administration, I did wonder if we had, I'm not asking for exa exact numbers, but it, is that correct? And is there some other piece of, of sort of the, um, the general ratio that we should be aware of? in terms of those open positions. So um, you're, you're accurate. The majority are in our special ed settings. Thanks. Um, it, it, and so I know that something that administration is, is probably also work, is also looking at is, are we, are we meeting the needs of our students in the most effective way by providing these staff members? So I, I know that we don't want to make shifts now, but I think that I'll be interested in seeing what that gives us in terms of um, where we end up with. Um, and then the only thing I will say, Mr. Chair, is that um, the, uh, the, the question around the, the paraprofessionals in the kindergarten classroom, and I, um, Dr. Morris already sort of anticipated where I was going with this, which was that I, um, I do just want to reiterate that uh, for most of our students, Kindergarten is their first classroom experience, and um, you know my joke always was the, well, not my joke. My the, the thing that I always said about teaching secondary was you know everybody knows how to tie their shoes and everybody can blow their own nose, and there's a need for additional adults in those in those really young ages, um, and it has bothered me that we continue to have an inequity across the city that you know our schools just kind of cope with because that's the way that things have been. Um, and it does feel like this is the year where we actually can finally bring ourselves up to parity and make sure that there's actually a parent in every classroom. So um, as we move through, I have a few other recommendations. Thanks. Okay, all set. So the motion is to approve. All those in favor, opposed, so ordered. We are on athletic coach salaries on page 194, athletic coaches. What's that? Oh, we already did that, that's correct, yeah. Uh, transportation salaries on page 195. Okay, we also have transportation salaries, Ms. Novick. Mr. Chair, it, it does feel as if um, you know it, we would only it would only be right for us to recognize the enormous amount of work that our transportation department has done this year. Um, I, I think I, I know I, I think I've quoted Member Kamara more than once, she, who said in a finance and operations meeting that 
we just like this is just how things are now and this is just our expectation but i know particularly any of us who were on the committee when we were having this sort of incredible meltdown um ref can reflect on what our among other things what our facebook messenger messages look like at an at 7 30 on an average school day morning um and we can even go farther back to when i wasn't on the committee and i was messaging member mccullough to tell her that my school bus wasn't coming um or my kid's school bus wasn't coming so i, I do just want to really um, acknowledge with enormous appreciation um, I mean everyone's work um, and certainly the administrators and those who who do the the operational end over there but the other thing is that um, we did something else that was really necessary but also was somewhat revolutionary which is that we had staff that were already working for us and then we brought in staff in or mostly from Durham but also from other places and you know, any of us who have walked into the transportation facility during the day, it's one group of people who are all pulling together in the same direction. Speaking, by the way, a whole bunch of different languages, which I also think is fantastic. Um, so I, I do just want to say that the, the degree to which this is just, it's a Worcester Public School Department and it does its job every day. And um, because we don't hear about it, that means that things are working. And also, of course, I want to reflect also on the somewhat sort of innocent question that that Vice Chair Johnson posed last year, which is, well, how come we, you know, we 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 make sure that the athletes can go to their stuff, but how come we don't do it for anyone else who has extracurriculars? That just then expanded naturally again without us having to speak to transportation, to not only that but to field trips and to so much more, um, which has provided enormous amounts of um, opportunity for so many of our students. So I I just want to make sure that that's sort of out there. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Okay, can we approve it, um, uh, Member Johnson? Thank you to the Chair, to the Administration. In regards to, <clears throat> I just, I don't know where this falls and I, I don't know what we're doing. So I, I know prior to COVID, we were providing transportation to students who had after school programs to different places. And that had stopped during COVID, you couldn't do it. And then, after COVID, we did not start that back up. So one, where would that fall at in this line item? And where are we at with going back to providing transportation to our students for after school programs that they need to attend? Uh, Ms. Ms. Dow? Through the chair. So we actually did resume providing after school transportation to the extent that we, and we're following the rules that we actually had before COVID, which was if we have a bus going in the direction of that after school provider, and we have capacity on the bus, then we have been allowing students to be placed on that bus to get to the after school provider. The challenge has, and I think where we're seeing is because we're running fewer buses, there's fewer buses potentially going in the areas of some of the after school providers. So we had a meeting, I think it was maybe four or five months ago with most of those after school providers with the expectation we'd have another meeting this summer to let us know, let them know where we are in our hiring status where we are in the number of routes we're planning to run for next year and the capacity we have to provide students a way to get to some of the after school placements and in regards to in regards to that if someone was interested in that how would they go about reaching out to inquire regarding this so the practice through the chair so the practice has been that we've had direct communication the transportation department has had direct communication with the after school providers themselves and then we've been reaching out to, or through the schools and reaching out to the schools to see um, uh, see if there's a ability to get that student on one of the buses headed in that direction. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Those in favor, approve. Those in favor, oppose, so ordered. Okay. We are on uh, supplemental program salaries on page 198. Member Novick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through the Chair to Administration, the, we, so it, uh, first of all, on page 199, um, there's several of these where the, setting aside the things that have been coming in and out of SR, um, they seem to be sort of bouncing around. So um, in line D, um, we budgeted at the $80,000 last year. We expect to only spend 52. We're budgeting 80,000 again. 
Um, similarly, in the ABA home servicing, we budgeted over 100,000 last year. We're expecting to spend 27. I appreciate that we're only budgeting 48, but um, do we have a, and then the same thing with the AVID program. Do we have a sense of what's happening with any of those? And I realize those are kind of disparate directions through the chair of administration. Madam Superintendent. I'm gonna ask um, Dr. Morris, Dr. Maganias, Ms. Seal to come up. That's a variety of programs that we yes. just listed. <coughs> Thank you. So I think I think I'm asking you about. We budgeted eighty thousand dollars for advanced placement last year. We spent fifty. We we're expecting to spend fifty-two. Um, do we know what happened through the chair? I think our plan is to continue to support advanced placement programs. Our students um, took 2,057 exams this past May in all of our high schools, and so we plan for that support to continue. We also support our students um, with after school extra help and through the Saturday sessions in some of the courses um, through MIE. So that um, support will continue. Um, we do get some reimbursements for the AP fees through um, the state and through MIE, so that may be the difference, but we do plan to continue the AP program mm -hmm. for the next school year. Okay, so um, some of this is is potentially about us maybe getting funding from someplace else that we're using? Potentially, Okay. Yes. Um, and thank you, by the way, for mentioning <clears throat> the number of tests that were taken. I appreciate the fact that we simply have carried forward the fact that if you were going to take an AP exam in the Worcester Public Schools, it is paid for by the Worcester Public Schools. I think that in terms of us, I guess, literally putting our money where our mouth is, I think that's something that's actually really important. Um, thank you. Thank and then you. I think the, the question about the but different between the ABA home servicing program, we budgeted 100000 and it only we only spent twenty seven. Yes, through the chair. Um, autism behavioral applied behavioral analysis is home service programs that's recommended by the IEP teams. And as for our students who have autism spectrum disorders, it's a team decision as to when we provide those services. So at one point we did have more students that required those services and now we're providing more services to students within the district. And some of our students do not require those home services. However, we do have students that do require home ABA services, and that's why there's a reduction in number. I think that the recommendation is to leave it pretty much within a similar budget is because we anticipate that things may change throughout the school year. Sure, thank you. And I appreciate, by the way, the res responsiveness the administration has to things like the sale preschool and that kind of thing in terms of us keeping a continued eye on what's coming towards us. Great, and what about the AVID program? The district is continuing the AVID program. We currently have 19 schools that are participating in the program. And so um, we also are um, supporting the AVID licenses for these schools and supporting the um, team meetings for these schools. So that is the funding that will continue to move forward for um, our elementary and um, our secondary schools. Okay, do we have a sense as to why we only spent $12,000 this year when it was budgeted for 37? I think we'll have to get back to you on okay. that. It's I'm not curiosity. Sure why it's I mean, such it, a decrease. keeping keeping it the same amount is fine. That's that's fine. Um, thanks. So then, to turn the page over to the 200, um, and just since we had a back and forth about this last year, um, the after school drop off session uh, center for this coming year is going to be at North High School because I think it's at Clark Street now through the chair of administration, or did we move it again? <laughs> Who's that? Who knows that? Oh. The safe haven, right? So the the, and speaking as someone who has had to use it before, right? So this is the kid gets left on the school bus because the parents aren't there, and we have to bring them somewhere. So it's going to be at North High School. Yes. Okay, and we need increase increased staff coverage because we didn't think we had enough people for the students who were being dropped off through the charter administration. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. 
Um, the me the music enrichment program in Line K. Um, we haven't talked about that in a while. Is that are we? It says after school programs. I know that we were at one point doing that during the school day. Did we when we put came back? into buildings stop doing it during the school day and now we only do it after school through the through chair to administration through the chair our music instrumental lessons do continue through the school day okay and then this is an addition to this is an addition to that great because i know that there's a huge equity issue as soon as we start having kids stay after school thank you um the so a, a question that i've been curious about and and partly this is reflecting on the um the adult learning center where they had sort of a, I don't know, if, 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 none of you, if you've never been to the adult learning center um, ceremony, I really recommend it. That partly through state support, partly honestly through federal support, Representative McGovern's been very good to us in terms of that, kind of expands to fill the, not the need yet, but we tend to get support for that program um, from a lot of different sources. And while it's outside of sort of much of what we spend our time on, I want to make sure that we're really being su supportive the way that we as a district need to on that. And I'm wondering if, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm disturbed to see the Adult Learning Center line go down. Um, are we, do we actually have the staff support from our budget that we need to support what I know to be largely grant funded programs through the chair to administration? And how are we gauging that? Talk through the chair us. currently we believe we have the right funding for the programs we run right now mm -hmm. with um chris chrisonis's position we plan on enhancing and expanding some of our adult education programming so that may shift mm -hmm. but for now for what we have planned for this year the idea is go small to go big mm -hmm. and right now we feel the staffing that we have is adequate but we believe in future years we may be asking for more okay thank you all set mr chair all set Member Clancy, followed by Member Kamara. Thank you. Um, so I just have one question um, regarding Line J, um, which St. Casimir's clinical program. So I know that there's clinical staff based at St. Casimir's. So I'm just curious what the 18,000 in additional is in terms of the clinical services for that program. Through the chair, historically, that has been a budget line item that has been um, on st been long standing throughout my yep. tenure and before. And my understanding is that they provide services for the students, tutorial services after school, before school, as well as clinical services throughout the school year. So, is it something that we see continuing next year, before school, after school? And I believe, if I remember correctly, some summer hours were used for this, and I know that that's looking a little different this year. So, is that something? that we're going to hold in the budget with hopes to continue going forward further? It's my understanding that it is proposed in the budget for this fiscal year, and that's something that will be ongoing. I would have to refer to administration. OK. OK, thank you. Member Kamara. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I want to ask some questions about the AVID program, and I think that's amazing. I heard that we are now putting that into our elementary schools. Wonderful. Is it all of the elementary schools, or is just a sample of through the chair, the AVID program is at City View, Norback, Chandler Magnet, Quinsigamond, May Street, Nelson Place, Lincoln Street, Canterbury, and Rice Square this school year. So are we the, so are we gonna expand? Is that, with this, is that what I heard? Through the chair, at this time, we do not have any additional schools that will be joining for next school year at the elementary level. Okay. And then um, just for clarification, um, is that program going to be or already under um, college and career readiness? Or like, what does that look like? Through the chair at this time, it is in the Office of Curriculum and Professional Learning. OK. OK. I guess like the reason why I'm asking, because um, uh, we had a what TLSS, um, and it's really amazing that we have it in the elementary school because it's, it, it was a question, a puzzle that I had um, that perhaps could be linked by this program at the elementary level with regards to keeping up with students from the elementary level to the middle school to the high school 
where that um, you could have a portfolio of students and their interests, which I don't think we currently do out of the AVID program. So I would love to talk to you about about that because I think that's the way that we could do that. But that's this is budget, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just clarification that um, adult education does not include nightlife. Thank you. What's that? So we'll take both of these line items together. All those in favor, opposed, so ordered. Uh, custodial services, page 201. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through the Chair of Administration, in um, the very useful um, vacancy information we got, we were told that um, currently there are 17 positions open, and I know that as I've been going um, to schools and so forth, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that's heard this, it's providing a considerable strain on the system because we're having to move you know, places where there are two, somebody covering an opening, and um, some of the second shift stuff, and obviously we've, we've moved money um, to cover overtime. And I'm wondering through the Chair of Administration um, sort of how we're seeing our prospects on that as we head into summertime in filling those positions. Um, if there are particular things that we're doing that are kind of maybe new or unusual in terms of recruiting, um, any of that sort of thing. Ms. So, Allen? Through the Chair, so I think since we've even done this report, we've hired two custodians. I think our current vacancies is 15 at this point in time. Mr. Eichen can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe we have six additional that are in the pipeline, okay. Corey checks and so forth. So um, some of those would likely pan out. And we actually just discussed this week some strategies if we can tap into any mass hire programs or some of like we do with bus drivers for custodians um, or um, any other networking that we can do to recruit uh, custodians. So that is what I would think is the highest priority right now for custodians is to fill the vacant positions. Mm -hmm. So that's where um, now we have a kind of a new uh, facilities team in place. Uh, they can focus some of their efforts on recruiting uh, people for filling those vacancies. Thank you. All those in favor, opposed so ordered. We have uh, maintenance service salaries, page 202. Improve that. All those in favor, opposed, so ordered. Then we have clerical salaries, administrative clerical salaries on page 203. Good. The motion is the number Nova. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this is the, the space where I, um, I, I really question, um, and it, one of the places I, I really question in addition. Um, I understand that we have elementary schools that um, have limited amount of, um, of staff in them. Um, but in terms of, and I understand that there are additional responsibilities that are going to be moving towards some of those positions with the workday system and so forth. Um, but 20 is a lot. 20 is a lot um, in terms of a secretarial ad. And so this is where my proposal, Mr. Chair, is that we take half of those. Um, so we know that the larger elementary schools in many cases either already have one or have one, or either already have one and a half or have two or so forth, um, that we have maybe kind of a middle tier in terms of enrollment and, and then we have some of our smaller schools. Um, I would like to propose, Mr. Chair, that we take effectively half of these positions um, and and move that funding um, into the paraprofessional account. Um, I, I don't want to pre-deliberate, I don't want to deliberate outside of the account, so I know we're going to be tempted to start to stray into the proposal that administration made. Um, I just want to say that I, I, would, I would really have a hard time moving money out of literacy positions this year with a new elementary curriculum. Um, but. Uh, uh, my my proposal then, Mr. Chair, is to take six hundred thousand dollars from administrative clerical and move it into the paraprofessional account as a way of moving money um, towards the twenty paraprofessional positions. Okay. Anybody else? 
Are you all done? Or? Okay. Member Novick, Member Clancy. Thank you. Um, I would also support that. I have actually been in contact with some of our clerical support at some of our schools. Um, and I, I want to say that if we do the 10 additional, I think it needs to be on a needs basis because I, some schools that I've talked to um, were very honest with me and said, if I had another person here, I, I don't know what I would do with them. But I would like to make an amendment to that motion because I did hear the need um, for two almost like floater positions to be covered for when they are out. I know that there's, I spoke with some um, clerical staff who say we have a really hard time covering when I need to go, you know, when I'm trying to take vacation um, or sick days and whatnot. So I would like to add, either take the 10 and take two of those, but have at least two floater positions that are fully trained and that could go to different schools to cover when our clerical staff are out. Um, Madam Superintendent? Yeah. I, th I, don't, I don't want to say so many well, No, I just would like to hear administration put forth a proposal for 20 new positions. So who will speak to that? Superintendent. Okay, thank you. So um, through the chair, the, the rationale for the need for these positions um, really are twofold. One in that um, what ends up happening at an elementary school when there is only one, one secretary um, is that in, the administrator ends up filling in and taking over for secretarial type of work. And that's not, not what we hire them to do. So if the secretary is busy and the front office is a very busy space where we greet our families, that's the very first place that you greet families, whether it's by the phone or it's in person. If the secretary is busy with a family for whatever reason, then um, I have been at my schools and I have seen where it is the principal who is handling it, um, which is fine, but it's not what we, that they, they are to fill in on emergency situations, not on a daily basis. We need them walking our classrooms. We need them providing teacher feedback. We need them to be that instructional transformational leader. So that's one of the reasons is um, them filling in when the secretary isn't there. I, I appreciate the idea of a floater. I think that would actually help because I've had principals tell me when the secretary is not there out for sickness or whatever life um, they are filling in there. So that, that would be helpful. Um, a second piece is heard loud and clear from the community during my listening and learning tour the importance of having um, a welcoming space when our families come in. And, um, and that would include um, individuals who um, are multilingual and right now that's not most of our staff. Now this isn't the only reason why, but that this can also provide an opportunity to hire multilingual individuals um, that would again be part of our family support to our families. Um, I don't, in speaking with Mr. Allen, and I hadn't even thought of this, but this will be a new piece with our um, new workday system that's coming from the city. Things that our current secretaries don't do, they will be required to do. They don't even know what's coming yet because it, it hasn't happened, but we know that things that have been handled at the district level because of the way the system works is going to be changing. So they don't know that yet. So of course, when they're making decisions, it's based off of their current status, not future. Um, the last piece that when our, and I'll let um, Ms. Hasselosa speak more to this, when our um, school adjustment counselors heard about someone addition that can really help with the work of attendance, um, they were actually very grateful um, and so, and they shared this with her. So if you'll speak a little to that. Yeah, so during my listening sessions back in January with my team, uh, I met with the school adjustment counselors and one of their biggest concerns is that the attendance calls were eating up about two hours per day um, during the school day. And so um, when I expressed to them that this was gonna be put into the budget during a meeting that I had with most of the school adjustment counselors, they were extremely pleased because they could spend more time addressing the mental health needs of our students. So that will also be part of the administrative clerk's um, role. Okay. 
McClancy. So yes, thank you. So my question though is, the typical attendance calls that a school adjustment counselor is making is not the typical attendance calls that we're asking our clerical staff to be making. They're completely different situations where a school adjustment counselor is, you know, deeping, you know, digging deep to find out why the student isn't coming to school, you know, what's going on. I think the clerical staff is just making a phone call. I, I don't know why the clerical staff would be making a phone call if a student is absent. I can't think of a scenario, but I'm just, I just think the school adjustment counselor's phone calls are much different than what a clerical staff phone call would be. Ms. Sessolsa? So through the chair, right now they're making most of the attendance calls. And so this would take away a lot of that weight off of school adjustment counselors. But are they making attendance calls to find out why the students are significantly absent? Yes. And, and trying I, to dig deep if there's services that they need or if there's other reasons why the students are absent. So the way I envision this is they would make the preliminary call. And it's really a shared responsibility because we understand the school adjustment counselors would still have to follow up with families. But it would really help to alleviate the time that it's taken the school adjustment counselors to make all of those calls and kind of weed out the ones that they wouldn't have to dig deeper to provide additional services, I, if that makes I, any sense. I, and I'm not trying to be, but I've, my daughters have been absent and no one's ever made an attendance call to my house. And my daughter right now, my high school is at like 13 absences. Sorry, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and that in itself is not okay. That's a problem. So we have to, not, not that this would take care of that because you're talking high school, right? Right. But, um, that's, we should not, we should have um, a better tracking system and know if a student is missing that many days, that's a potential chronic absenteeism. We want to get those supports that are needed, not to put your daughter on the... No, it's fine. <laughs> but, you know, so those are the kind of things um, that we're looking at. Right, and I, like I said, and I understand, but I just know speaking with some of the elementary principals and, and clerical staff, I just don't know if 20 are needed across the board. That's just my concern. If it, it's, I want it more to be more of a need than more of we're telling them we're putting another person here. You need to come up with things for them to do. Okay, all set. Member McCall. Thank you. I think then to tag on to Member Clancy's question, was the proposal of 20 based on the principals asking for those 20 spots or were we just filling every school that didn't have to? So I'll respond to that. Um, when I, and I'm going to take it a step further back, um, when the committee hired me, one of the asks of the committee in a general sense was to um, bring in the experience that I have working in schools for 28 years. Um, which I'm finishing up 29, so there you go. Um, and what are some things that I've seen over the years that are missing here? What can further help? And I will say that I have, this, this is my very first time walking into elementary schools and not seeing two people in a front office in any district I've ever worked in. And it's because the front office is the welcoming space. The front office is a child comes in and they've got, you know, they just scrape their knee and, and that, that front office is the place that helps them. Now I know we have, we have people that do that too, but I've had that in other schools as well, where you have a nurse and you have, um, and, 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 and you have, a, well, we, they've always been called office managers and you have a clerk and the clerk is the one that calls the homes if a child's absent to clear why is this child absent. Um, the clerk is the one who is the initial greeter to the families when they come in. They're the ones who answers the phone within the first three rings so that families know that there's somebody there. The office manager is the one that runs the back room, if you will, of the school and all the clerical behind the scenes um, to, so that the principal can actually lead the school. So it did not come from the principals because the principals have, they only know what they know. Um, our larger elementary schools have one, at least two, I guess some one and a half um, people. And then our principals have done these workarounds. So just like they've done workarounds in other areas, they've done this workaround. Um, so I understand it's a lot of positions all at once. Um, 
I firmly believe, and, and we can go slow on this one too, but once our schools get a second person and they see what is required of them, they will be asking for it just like they started asking for the dean. You don't know what you don't know yet. And that's, that's the other side of it. So it is not a die-hard um, ask. It is definitely something that I would like us to work towards in the future. We don't have to do it all at once. So would administration be comfortable with the proposal of the 10 plus the two float? Would that be something that would work in this model to start out with and then look at for next year of fully? Yes, we would be comfortable with it. And my only, and it's just the, the hard part on here is I would really want us to then very much be clear on is it 10 or is it only eight because based off of number. And I don't have those numbers right here right now. So if we budget on 10 and we do two extra, and if we during the, the year see, you know, we're going to just start with these schools based off of data. Maybe we go with the schools with the highest attendance need, mm -hmm. and we, we place them there, and then we, we monitor. I, that's my only thought. Sure. But we would be OK. I, I, it would be fine to start small, um, knowing that it is a priority of the committee to have also the paraprofessionals, which we are in agreement is also needed. Thank you. I think you know the 10 full time, and then not that the others wouldn't be full time, but being more of two floats. Uh, would be something I would be comfortable with to see how it goes and then go from there. But that's just my opinion. Okay, so, <clears throat> so we all set with the, the vote on the two votes in the amendment. Um, Member Novak? So we're going to need it. So, first of all, that's going to leave me $65,000 short, just to be clear. We're not actually going to have the money to do the 20 the way that I was talking about. Um, the, I, we also would need to change the, the, if what you're doing is making a motion, we need to change what the motion is because we would need to change the dollar amount that we're transferring. Um, I also just want to say that what was just described, just in kind of all of my experience as a Worcester Public School parent, isn't actually how absences come to families. We have an automated calling system. We get a computerized phone call that tells us that our student was absent. Um, I have had outreach, but I, I want to say I really strongly, strongly agree with Member Clancy that it, it really shouldn't be the person at the front desk who's making a phone call to say, your kid's been absent a lot and we want to check on that. Like, first of all, that's not the place that that conversation should be heard um, or possibly overheard. But secondly, also, I, my, my sense is that this is why we're making sure we have have wraparound coordinators at every school, and it's also why we have the adjustment counselors that we do. Um, so I'm still not actually hearing an attendance thing that they're actually doing that is actually their, the, the responsibility of, of the clerical position within a school, um, because that's, that's, it's, just, it's not where the phone call comes from. Um, it's not, certainly not where the initial phone call comes from. And then a follow-up phone call, if our intent is to put people in touch with services, we have a different job for that. Um, so I mean, I, I would say that if what we want to do is two floaters, I would say let's keep the 10 and make it eight that are staffing and two that are floating. Um, because uh, you know I, I, I agree that in terms of um, you know, what I have seen in front offices, um, they can get busy, they also can be really quiet. Um, we have schools that are lots and lots and lots of different sizes, um, that have lots and lots of different um, levels of sort of uh, activity and need in those front offices. Um, and I understand the notion of um, the principal as instructional leader, I also think that once in a while, having the principal being the person who's at the front desk is kind of a nice thing. Um, I, I think it can kind of be positive. So, um, you know, unless my colleagues want to, I guess I, I need, I would like to know, um, are my colleagues proposing that we have eight positions that are in, in particular position places with two floaters? Or are you suggesting that we would effectively have 12 positions and be moving the money for eight? What was the motion? That was a good question. I wasn't clear on that myself. No, so to be clear, I'm fine. If it gives us the positions for our, including the literacy tutor transfer, so we're still short with those two floater positions. Am I understanding? I didn't do the math, so. So, so I, was, I was avoiding touching the literacy tutors in what I was putting together. 
um, the administration is constructing sort of a different right. a different column of addition. So what's the suggestion is it cut ten positions and if, um, make the recommendation to the superintendent that whether they should use those eight and two two forwarders. Is that correct? So the, and that's already been the money's already been worked that, out. That was what I was trying to was attempting yeah. to clarify with with yeah. really member Clancy in terms of her recommendation. Yeah. I'll okay. do the, the I, I'm fine, I, as long as administration, the eight positions with the two floaters. Maybe McCall? I'm sorry, and I don't want to keep belaboring this. So that's still just 10 positions, right? That's what, like, Correct. So I, I guess I would say 10 positions is fine, and if you feel the float would work that way, or if they need to be in an actual building, I would be fine with that. Like, it, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the 10 positions. I was thinking of the float earlier as an option for some of the schools that may not be as busy, but if we're not doing all 20, then that's probably a moot point anyway. So the 10 positions is fine with me. Okay. Yes, uh, Member Mealman? And if we're really trying to, through the chair, hit a certain number of kindergarten positions, we don't even know what that number is, do we? Do we have that solid number? $900,000. Through the chair, nine hundred. we're trying to achieve $900,000. You would be at seven eighty five. But do we this. know that that's the number of? You, we know that for sure. Okay, thank you. We know that we need twenty instructional aid paraprofessionals to cover all of our okay. existing kindergarten classrooms and future ones that we know about. Thank you. Okay, we good on that, everyone. So the motion is to uh, make that transfer of ten positions, um, and also to approve this. Roll call. Yes. 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 Okay, we're going to break and go into executive session, and uh, we will come back and do the uh, least the recognitions. We can either go and finish the. Either way, it's going to be either the budget when we come back, or it's going to be. And it keeps the budget to the end, one or the other. So, okay. Um, what? Oh, we have recognitions. Are people here? Is Meredith Ford here? You've got them here. So, uh, who do you want? To, who's on the? Let me see. Hang on. So, first one is set a date to recognize Andrea Cook, a teacher at Burncoat Middle School, who has been awarded the 2023 Donna Nagel Award for Excellence in General Music. Member. We're not sure. She Okay, we'll go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. Oh. Okay, so we're going to recognize uh, 
Andrea Cook, teacher at Burnco Middle, who has been awarded the 2023 Donna Nagel Award for Excellence in General Music. Andrea. <laughs> Madam Superintendent. Yes, so um, a little bit about this award. It's presented annually. It's very nice to see you. Um, it recognizes someone who's been a leader in the field of general music in Massachusetts, and anyone who visits Burncoat Middle knows that about um, Ms. Cook. This award is, um, g may be given to any M M E A member. Don't ask me what that acronym means, but I'm sure Massachusetts and music is part of that. <laughs> Massachusetts Music Educator Association. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to qualify by either being employed by a private or public institution for at least 10 years um, and de demonstrated outstanding leadership and dedication in the general field of music and has made important contributions to this field. And um, I've only been here for, as we know, uh, just under a year and I have already seen Ms. Cook in action more than once um, and her advocacy for um, the program and the students she serves is definitely um, to be commended, and I can't think of um, someone who should not be receiving this award, um, anybody better than you, Ms. Cook. So thank you for your service and dedication. Okay, okay we have a certificate of recognition uh, of Andrea Cook for receiving the 2023 Donna Nagel Award for Excellence in General Music, signed by myself, the superintendent, and the entire Worcester School Committee. Here you go. Okay, well, next one up, we have uh, set a date to recognize Meredith Ward for receiving the William P. Foster Community Development Award. Meredith. Good to see you. Congratulations. You all set, Superintendent? Yeah, so let me talk a little bit about this award. So this also is given annually, and it's given to band directors who provide strong music education experience for students and the positive impact on the school and community. Um, I'm, I'm just reading my notes. So nominees are then requested to provide a short written description of their students, school, and community impact. I, I can only imagine what you may have written. Um, I'm not gonna put you on the spot to share that, but I'm, I'm sure it was pretty phenomenal. Um, school band directors are eligible, and you have to have been in the position for at least five years. I have not been able to see Miss Lord in action quite as much, but um, I can only imagine how fabulous her work has been, and it's always so nice for Worcester Public Schools employees who give so incredibly much to be recognized. So again, thank you for everything you do for our scholars. Much appreciated. Oh, so we have a nice gift here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, hi, how are you? Oh my goodness, thank um, you, thank so you. You did well. You're not was, supposed yeah. to gift us when we're recognizing you, but thank you. Okay, we do have thank a you. certificate of recognition to Meredith Ford in receiving the William P. Foster Community Development Award. Uh, so I'm myself, the superintendent, and the entire Worcester School Committee. Here you go, Meredith, congratulations. Thank you. We're gonna take a picture. Yeah. So once you two get in the middle, Andrea and, and Meredith get right here in the middle, and we'll take a group shot, I guess. And the students still, yep.
Now we're adjourned. Executive session. So we'll take a vote to go into executive session. So, okay, this will take a half hour to read. But okay, so we're going to discuss strategy with respect to. We will return to open session after executive session. So we're going to, the motion is going to executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining. If the open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the buying position of the public party, and the chair so declares, which I do for the following items: successor contract negotiations, the EAW and its AMB. Uh, successful contract negotiations, EAW and structural assistance, uh, and also for international union and public employees, plumbers and stipe fitters, local 125. Also for international union of public employees, tradesmen, tradesmen, and local 135. And also for Teamsters, local 170, and for behalf of the Worcester Public Schools, transportation and mechanics, and also Massachusetts Laborers District Council for and on behalf of the Worcester Public Service Employees Local Union 272 of the Laborers International Union of North America, AFL-CIO Educational Secretaries, and also for the Education Association of Worcester Parent Liaison Associations, and also for NAGE R1 to 156, 52-week Administrative Secretaries Unit, and also for Education Association for Worcester Therapy Assistance Unit, and also for Massachusetts Nurses Association for on behalf of the Worcester School Nurses and to discuss strategies with respect to the collective bargaining for, for the Juneteenth holiday for all Worcester Public School bargaining units, for the EAW A and B, for EAW of Worcester Aids to the Physically Handicapped, Members and Drivers, EAW of Worcester Instructional Assistance, EAW of Worcester Parent Liaison, EAW of Worcester Tutors Education Association of Worcester Therapy Assistance, NAGE I1 to 156, 52 week secretaries, uh, and age I 1 to 16, cafeteria workers, International Union of Public Employees, plumbers and st steam fitters, local 125, uh, International Union of Public Employees, tradesmen, local 135, uh, Massachusetts Nurses Association, Worcester School Nurses, Worcester Public Service Employees, local union 272 of the Laborers, International Union of North America, AFL CIO, Educational Secretaries, Massachusetts Laborers District Council for on behalf of the Worcester Public Schools Employees Local Union 272 of the Laborers International Union of North America, AFL-CIO, also for custodians, Massachusetts Laborers District Council for on behalf of the Worcester Public Schools Service Employees for Local Union 272 of the Laborers International Union of North America, AFL-CIO Unit D, Computer Technicians, and the Teams of Local Union 174 on behalf of the Worcester Public Schools Transportation Mechanics. And also, for former employee teacher, we have a uh, litigation uh, and also declared that this will be detrimental to the, uh, the public body. So we have a former employee versus the Worcester Public Schools charge uh, filed with the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination. Roll call. Yes. 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 Okay, we're good.